Hi, I'm David Anderson, and today we are joined uh, by Danny Ross. Danny was the Vice President and Chief Operating Officer of the Timex Computer Corporation from, I'm gonna, I hope I get this right, from March 1982 until January 1984. Danny was brought in to start the computer uh, division of Timex Computer Corporation. Um, <clears throat> And he was responsible for the worldwide operations of the corporation. Under his direction, Timex captured 28% of the home computer market. They developed three computer systems and more than and delivered more than 200 software titles. Um, if you paid any attention to Timex computers in the early 80s, Danny was the public face. You would see his you know, face in popular electronics in info world um, <clears throat> in any kind of any kind of print uh, article about the Timex computer Danny was usually the person being quoted demonstrating the computer uh, introducing new products and so with that I'm going to turn the floor over to Danny and he can tell us all about himself and his world good appreciate that David uh, first, I want to say how excited I am. Uh, a couple of months ago, uh, I heard about the discussions that this group has twice a month, and uh, it was very exciting to me that uh, there's so much interest in something that occurred 40 years ago that sold for $100 at retail, $99, I should say, at retail, and had so much interest in today's time. Uh, today, what I'd like to do is to kind of give you a little bit of background of, on how I got to Timex, uh, tell you a little bit about my experience with Timex, and tell you some stories that I think that uh, most of you are not aware of that uh, uh, would be of interest to you uh, that you probably haven't heard before, uh, stories that uh, were important to uh, Timex at the time. Uh, first of all, just on, on my personal background, uh, I grew up in Louisiana, uh, in a very small town in Louisiana, uh, about 5,000 people. Uh, uh, the, the town is noted for lots of pine trees, lumber mills, and, and pulpwood. And, whoops, uh, whoo. I guess I'm still on, uh, but I'm seeing a picture now of the I would have a Timex computer that's in a suitcase. Uh, but at any rate, David is... Hang on, I'm working on it. <laughs> <Okay. laughs> uh, but uh, back in the, uh, the early days, uh, I uh, uh, attended Louisiana Tech. Uh, I got a degree in math and computer science. Uh, the computer science in 1960s, uh, uh, was a little different than it is today. Uh, I might say we, at, at my college, Louisiana Tech, we had a 1620 computer that had uh, uh, 16K of uh, memory on it. Uh, it was powered by punch cards and uh, uh, we programmed in Fortran. And that was the extent of computer science at, uh, at that stage of the game. And from there, I went to, uh, to IBM and I spent two years at IBM learning more about computers than I had learned in college uh, and worked with IBM for a number of years and uh, was, a, was a, a, attracted away from IBM by the former branch manager of the San Francisco office. He started a new company called ITEL Corporation. And at that time, you couldn't, uh, uh, you couldn't, you couldn't not, uh, 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 they just started selling. They you could buy a computer. Uh, they hadn't started leasing computers at that time, and we were in the leasing business. And uh, so I learned a lot about finance there. Uh, from there, uh, I started a finance company for Memorex Corporation, and uh, it was from that position that I ended up uh, uh, being contacted by a headhunter, uh, and his name is Stuart Bader. And Stuart uh, uh, 
asked me if I would be interested in a personal computer uh, company called Timex, that they were trying to get in the business and they were looking for somebody to run the business. And it sounded very interesting to me. Apple was getting a little interest at that time and a lot of discussion about it. This was back in 81, 82. And uh, uh, he submitted my uh, resume to uh, uh, Timex and I ended up getting the job there at Timex. Uh, before joining them, while I was in college, uh, one of the things that attracted uh, IBM to me is that I started a business. My first business that I started was at, during my final year at Louisiana Tech. Uh, and I was a door-to-door -door wig salesman. A friend of mine, uh, uh, and this was the 1960s, Diana Ross and the Supremes were very popular at that time. And they were wearing uh, uh, a lot of bouffant hairdos and wigs. And, and uh, it became a, uh, uh, and I sold wigs door to door uh, to a little community down the street, Grambling, which is an all black uh, college, uh, which is located about four miles down the street. And they called me Mr. Dan, the wig man. And uh, uh, I learned a lot about business during that time, learned a lot about dealing with people, learning a lot about solving problems and made some money. I could buy wigs for $15 and sell them for a hundred and they were selling in retail for $250 at that time. So that was a pretty good deal. The only problem was that my customers didn't have a hundred dollars. So I had to figure out some way to get the, get the product financed. And I went to two finance companies, one called Friendly Bob Adams and the other one called Understanding Henry. And I ended up uh, uh, doing business with Understanding Henry. And uh, I would go to him with a, with a uh, uh, loan agreement for $100 and he would give me $85 if they passed credit on the spot. And so I bought it for 15, sold it for 85 and and I thought that was a pretty good margin at that time. At any rate, uh, from IBM, Memorex, then to Timex. Uh, Timex was just an exciting place at that time. It really was. And uh, first thing I did, of course, was meet with Clive Sinclair. Uh, uh, Clive was the most unusual guy I think that I've met in my lifetime. Uh, I spent a lot of time with him over the two plus years that I was with Timex and Clive was a, uh, uh, a bright guy. As you know, he was the head of Mensa. Uh, he was the, uh, uh, spoke and, and had an office at, uh, at Cambridge university. And he was a, uh, uh, just an unusual guy. He had two personalities. When you turn the camera on Clive, his personality total, totally changed. Uh, he turned into uh, uh, a guy that liked, liked, to, liked, liked to have the right lights on. And he could really, really smooth, smooth the, uh, the crowd. And it was, it was incredible. Uh, Clive was, uh, he was a genius for sure. Uh, and he obviously, you folks know, he liked to build something that uh, was inexpensive and was useful. And he did that number of time, number of times. Uh, some of the uh, uh, products, of course, he was very instrumental in, in getting to us. The, the first product, of course, he introduced was the uh, ZX81. And that was a, the identical mod, model of that we introduced uh, uh, in, uh, well, we, the introduction came at the uh, uh, Central Park in New York. Uh, we, uh, we had an announcement that Timex was getting into the computer business and we went there and introduced the world's first computer to sell for uh, less than $100. Um, I'll show you a copy of one of those computers in a second. But, uh, at that uh, presentation, uh, there was just a lot of interest that was produced, I think, uh, in the New York Times and the uh, Wall Street Journal, papers all over the country, as, as I think, uh, uh, carried the uh, story of that. Uh, lots of newspapers. 
at that time I had a little bit more hair than I have now. Uh, David, David mentioned that the face of Timex had my picture in, but this is one of the pictures here uh, that appeared in one of the computer magazines. Uh, and you can see I had a little bit more hair than I have today in that picture. But uh, that being said, uh, it, it was an exciting time. Um, a guy named Ben Rosen, Ben Rosen was with uh, uh, an investment banking firm. He followed the, in, the industry. And Ben Rosen uh, really caught on to, to Timex. Uh, and of course he knew Timex the watch company, but uh, uh, the announcement he felt was very important. And Ben started inviting me to, uh, to attend uh, uh, some of his uh, analyst meetings. And at these analyst meetings, they had two other early, early people in the, the uh, 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 personal computer business. Uh, of course, we were in, in segments that was themed at the time to be the home computer marketplace. And the people participating in that marketplace were Commodore, Texas Instrument, later Atari, and then uh, Coleco got into it towards the, the end of the, uh, the game. But uh, people that were in the uh, Ben Rosen conference were, uh, I, in fact, I sat in on several of these meetings on panels with Steve uh, and uh, Bill Gates. Um, very interesting, very smart people. Steve was a very uh, inventive person, as we all know. Uh, uh, he had he had a personality that he would he would take a shot at you if he got a shot at it. And he one one of the uh, presentations that I was making, I talked about Timex being uh, a brand name that was noted around the world. As people were looking at that brand name multiple times a day when they looked at their watch and it reflected on the, uh, the brand name. Uh, and that being the case, uh, when we introduced the computer, uh, we had things that other people didn't have. We had a distribution channel and a brand name that nobody else had. And that was very important to our introduction. Most companies fail because they don't get distribution. Most, most companies do end up getting product technology, but the distribution is a tough thing to do. And that, became something that we were able to do better than and, and easier than most, not maybe better, but uh, it, I, I talked about Timex and, and watching, there was a lot of investment bankers, uh, these were rich dudes uh, in the audience. And, uh, and I talked about the fact that, that, you know, our name would be recognized more than anybody else's because, and when Steve Jobs got up and started talking, he, knew the audience. He knew that they were high rollers. And he got up and he said, Timex. And he looked at his watch, Timex. How many of you have a Timex watch on? Of course, these were investment bankers and they had Rolexes on. Nobody raised their hand. He said, case closed. <laughs> so that was the story of my Steve. I kept up with Steve uh, over the years. Uh, and as well as Bill Gates. Uh, and uh, it, it, was, it was quite an experience and I was humbled to be in their, their, uh, in their company. Uh, the, uh, when we introduced the first computer uh, sale, it was at Macy's department store in, uh, in New York City. Uh, this is one of the world's biggest stores. And it was really, really interesting how people were lined up outside of the store uh, to get a Timex computer. And we sold thousands of them, you know, the first day that we opened the door up. And uh, it was a, a very exciting day for Timex. And we did that intentionally because we knew it would get a lot of press coverage and start to get the Timex uh, uh, in the computer business out before the public. Uh, Over time, uh, there was an interest in Timex. We advertised as a, uh, the first thing we had to do was uh, 
to hire a PR firm and to hire an advertising agency. And the PR firm we hired was a uh, company called Reuter and Finn. A guy named Bernie Mogalever was the uh, PR uh, director uh, and he handled our business and he did an incredible job of public relations. Public relations is a lot less expensive than uh, uh, to do than advertising. And he did a heck of a job of, of, of public relations. And we won the award that year for uh, for public relations. It's called the Silver Anvil, Anvil Award that the company won that year uh, for public relations. The, uh, the second person we hired was an advertising agency. Uh, and we interviewed several agencies. Uh, Timex, of course, had been noted for a guy named, uh, uh, who always said that, you know, uh, takes a licking and keep on ticking. Uh, John Cameron Swayze was the kind of the PR person for the watch company. And uh, we were looking for an advertising agency that could take our brand, take that, that brand and move it in the computer business. And we interviewed several. One of the companies we interviewed was J. Walter Thompson. J. Walter Thompson was the agent at the time for Kodak. And Kodak was introducing, at that time that, that I was doing the interviewing, a little camera that had a disc cassette uh, to it. You might have seen that, that camera over the years. Uh, and the uh, agents, the Executives on that account for uh, for J. Walter Thompson were a guy it was a guy named Peter Schweitzer and a second guy named Bill Campbell. Uh, these names may not mean anything to you, but uh, they were significant fact factors in the advertising business. Uh, Peter Schweitzer went on to be become the agent uh, in charge of uh, Ford Motor Company's account and a lot of big accounts as well as as Timex. And my deal was I would select J. Walter Thompson as our agent. We had a, we had a pretty good sized budget, advertising, television budget. Uh, we'd, we'd select them, but I wanted to get that team, uh, Campbell and, uh, and Schweitzer, and they agreed to do that, which meant that Campbell had to leave the Kodak account. And, uh, and so we, uh, they came to, to Timex and, uh, uh, Bill Campbell was an un unusual guy. Let me let me give you a little bit of his background that I think would be of interest to you. Two years before I met Bill Campbell, he was the head football coach at Columbia University. He had played football there as a student, uh, and and Bill was a uh, uh, an, an incredible athlete. He was well known at at Columbia. But he realized that he wasn't going to be able to get that white picket fence around his house that he wanted to get being a football coach at Columbia because football, you know, they were not Alabama. They were not uh, Georgia now, as I would say, since we finished as world champion, two uh, national champion twice in a row here. And uh, but uh, uh, so he decided he needed to look elsewhere for a career and he went to work for uh, uh, J. Walter Thompson. Bill was an incredible uh, help to us. He came up with the uh, slogan that we used, which was the powers within your reach, was the slogan that we used it to, it, uh, to, as our branding. And the power within our reach, uh, uh, you know, was very successful in, in, in uh, launching the product. The uh, uh, Bill, I spent lots of time with him strategizing on marketing issues. He was more than, a, than just an advertising guy. And I, uh, after a while, I needed a VP of marketing. And I went, I went to Fred Olson, who owns Timex, and asked him if he would allow me to hire Bill Campbell as my, his v, my VP of marketing. He looked at Bill's resume and said he was a football coach two years ago. I don't think he's the right guy. Well, that was mistake number one. I think we made in the history of, 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 of 
of our computer company. Uh, I say it was mistake number one because shortly after that, Bill uh, was approached by a uh, guy named John Scully, who had met John, who had met uh, Bill before. John had just taken over as uh, CEO of uh, Apple Computer. Steve Jobs was on a little furlough at that time. And uh, I just put it that way. And uh, uh, John Scully was brought in from PepsiCo to run uh, uh, Apple Computer. And he knew Bill Campbell. And he hired Bill Campbell to be the VP of Marketing for Apple. Uh, Apple later, Bill joined the board of, of Apple. He's one of their board members. And then later, Bill became kind of the person that was known throughout Silicon Valley. Although he came from the East Coast, he went to Silicon Valley and set things on, uh, lit things up there. He got to uh, become kind of an advisor to a lot of the people that became legends at uh, Silicon Valley. Uh, he was alleged, he was an advisor to Apple, of course. He was an advisor to Google when they started out. Uh, he was an advisor to the board of uh, Amazon. And this uh, actually, uh, uh, he was given credit, Bill Campbell was given credit for uh, uh, being the guy that uh, provided the launching pad for Google's success and Amazon's and Apple. He was a very big advocate of Steve Jobs and, and was instrumental in getting him brought back into the company after he started his own computer company and came back with his Lisa computer. Um, Eric Smits, the founder of uh, Google, a couple of years ago wrote a book on the life of Bill Campbell. It's called The Trillion Dollar Coach. And I, if you haven't uh, read that book, I would encourage all of you to, to read it. It's quite a book. The companies that Bill Campbell was involved with after we didn't hire him as a coach at market, uh, to be the marketing director of Timex Computers, uh, he was instrumental in building companies according to Eric Smits and others out in, on the West Coast. And, the, and, and the, the book, I said, as I said, was called The Trillion Dollar Coach, the story of Bill Campbell. Bill died a couple of years ago. He had, he had cancer and uh, he died. He was, he was, I kept, I was a friend of his and, until he died. He was quite a guy. It's interesting, Steve Jobs actually did the, uh, the uh, his uh, uh, eulogy. At, and spoke at his funeral, which was, was kind of neat. Uh, that was a mistake that I think we made that could possibly have extended our, our time in business beyond 1984. I think that was a, one of the steps that took place. We, uh, we had distribution in all over places that other people never thought about distributing computers to. And as David said earlier, we have achieved a 28% market share. And we uh, uh, did that in the first five months that we were in business, uh, competing against companies that have been in the market for some time. And uh, the, the product was off and running. Uh, of course, the first product that we introduced was this little product that I have in my hand here. Uh, let's see if I can get it in front of the screen. Uh, the 1000. This 1000 that I have in front of me is, uh, is an interesting product. Uh, I think you'd find it very interesting. Um, as you know, we built products in Dundee, Scotland. We built them in Lisbon, Portugal, and later we built some in, uh, in Seoul, Korea. And uh, we were contacted by uh, the Smithsonian uh, uh, and They asked us about our computer because it was monumental. It was the first computer to sell for nine, uh, for not less than hundred dollars, and and they were asking us for one of our computers. We had a computer that was made in uh, uh, in Portugal, the one that was made in uh, uh, Dundee, Scotland. 
serial number one of each of those lo locations, serial number one. And I have in my hand here, serial number one, if I can get it up here, you can see that's number one right there. This is the first computer made in Dundee, Scotland. Uh, the one that we gave to the Smithsonian was serial number one made in Lisbon, Portugal. Uh, and, and that's today sitting alongside the ENIAC computer at the Smithsonian. And somewhere I've got a picture. Let's see if I... This is a picture of me and the curator at the Smithsonian uh, when we donated that computer and it's still sitting alongside the ENIAC and goes to the Smithsonian. Uh, and you can see that, that computer at the uh, Smithsonian. It, it, it's kind of interesting. When I was with IBM, I installed lots of computers that had 16K of memory on it, maybe 8K even, uh, 360 Model 20. And they were punch card uh, computers and we would do complete applications for savings and loans, banks, uh, manufacturing uh, firms, uh, doing inventory control, uh, uh, putting their, uh, their, their, their accounting systems on the, uh, uh, on the system, on these small computers. And, you know, to have a computer like this, it, ours had 2K, of course, Clive's original one, which is the ZX81, only had 1K. Uh, but of course, it used this module here to, if I can get it in front of me, uh, that was the thing that turned it into a 16K computer. And uh, so it was, uh, it was revolutionary. I think, I like to think about it in today's terms, you'd call this, we were a disruptor. That's basically the pop purpose that we serve. We were a disruptor in the marketplace. Uh, we created real problems and that term is used a lot today uh, when you look at technology coming into the marketplace i mean uh, you'd have to say the biggest disruptor in marketplace today probably was the internet and uh, uh, that certainly uh, changed the landscape of uh, of technology uh, today i think uh, artificial intelligence it seems to be breaking into this and things like uh, uh, augmented reality, uh, virtual reality, these kind of things are starting to take root, I think, and they, they probably will be the disruption uh, that we're talking about uh, in a few years from now. But uh, this computer, I think, was the, the disruptor, and it turned out to be a disruptor that didn't work to our benefit. Uh, the, as I say that because other people in the marketplace, TI had a computer that they initially brought on the marketplace for something in the range of uh, uh, three or $400. Uh, it was primarily used for games. Uh, it had color capability. Ours didn't initially, of course. And the uh, 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 we, Clive uh, initially introduced the, the ZX81 to be a serious computer. He wanted it to be something that was serious as opposed to being a game playing machine. And that's the, most, the thing that we did. But the thing that I was most excited about, what we did and the contribution we made, I think we built one of the biggest cottage industries in the shortest period of time in history. Uh, most of our software were developed by third party people. And these were people who uh, would put together software on a, a cassette tape. And it would be, we would take and put our brand on it, uh, package it, put it in our distribution channel and pay them a royalty on, on this. And we had literally hundreds of little cottage software people that were building uh, these programs. This happened to be one called ViewCap. This was our version of a uh, uh, spreadsheet. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, another one, you know, another one, this is, a, here's Algebra 1. This is, we were big in the literacy market, of course, and Algebra 1, we use that in our schools. Uh, the, uh, here's Algebra 2. This is uh, <laughs> more transfers than 
algebra one. Uh, statistics, strategy football. We had one that was uh, uh, for the uh, flight simulator. That was a big deal back in those days. Uh, uh, and it was a pretty, pretty sophisticated. I introduced the, the flight sim sim simulator at the uh, Boston Computer Conference uh, back in 1982. And uh, it, was, it was amazing what this little 16K computer could do with a flight sim simulator. At any rate, that's, I'm kind of going around a lot of different circles here. I mentioned that we were a disruptor, but after a while, people started dropping the prices on their computers. Uh, TI's computer, uh, as I mentioned earlier, was initially selling for three to four hundred dollars. They dropped their price down to less than a hundred dollars. Uh, and of course, their computer was a lot more sophisticated than our little uh, black and white computer, and uh, it was uh, a uh, uh, we had to drop our prices also. It, our, our computer to build in the quantities that we were building in, I think that, and you can maybe correct me, uh, uh, Joe, if you want to, uh, uh, it was in the uh, $16, $17 range is what it cost us to build the, the computer at that time, $16, $17. And of course we were selling them at wholesale into the retail marketplace uh, for about $65. And so the margin was $15, $16 up to uh, $65. And then they were selling for $100. I think that was kind of the program we had. But then we had to drop the prices down. So our margins were decreased. And uh, towards the end of the lifespan of uh, Timex, uh, we uh, we started building computers in uh, in Korea. Uh, uh, we uh, we built a lot of a lot of uh, the technology there, and we decided we needed to go into uh, uh, to China because the labor cost there was a lot less than anywhere else uh, that you could have that you could have, and we uh, we set up our uh, uh, a meeting with China, and this was in the early days of opening up uh, China. Uh, President uh, Nixon had, had just opened it up a few years earlier than that, and people were just going into China for the first time. And we had, uh, of course, uh, re representatives in Hong Kong, and they arranged for us to have meetings in, in China. And the uh, meeting was set up we met, the, uh, you know, the group met and our entourage met in, uh, in, in Hong Kong and made our way over to Guangzhou. Uh, that's what we call it today, but it was called Canton at that time, Canton, uh, to meet with the leaders, technology, people from the government of China. And our intentions were to get them to manufacture our products over there, but also to uh, be able to distribute in in uh, in China uh, at that time you know, the large market, and I went into Guangzhou on a uh, uh, hydrofoil uh, up the Canton River, and it was kind of interesting to see the technology that existed in in uh, uh, China at that time. As I was going up the Canton River, I'd look out one side, and there'd be uh, rice paddies on one side. And they'd be uh, harvested or uh, worked by uh, water buffaloes. That was the technology that they had. On the other side, there might be a tractor once in a while, but they were 1920 version tractors of the US. They had big cock wheels on them and a lot different than the tractors you see from John Deere and, and our companies here in the US today. But the technology wasn't there. When we landed in, uh, in, in Hong Kong, uh, there were no cars on the street. They had very few cars. They only had bicycles at that time. And so we went in. Uh, the person that I was to meet with, his last name, was, his name was Song, S-O-N-G. And uh, he came to Guangzhou from Beijing. Uh, he was 
billed as being the chief technology person of the whole of China that we were meeting with. And our, again, our intentions were to uh, sell the product there, but also to build product in, uh, in China. Uh, it was a kind of an interesting time. We, uh, it's the first time that I had had experience in dealing with the Chinese. And I learned a new thing called the Gombe. Uh, Gombe uh, is, you may recall Richard Nixon, maybe some of you might be old enough to know when Rich, Richard Nixon went to China with the Henry Kissinger. He, uh, uh, apparently they did Gombe to him, which basically is a drink that in our case, they asked us to bring in brandy and we brought in brandy, which is not a, not a weak drink. And that's what we, they served in the Gombe. And, uh, but they did that to Richard Nixon and Richard Nixon had too many Gombe's and he got a little bit of loot uh, in the meeting. <laughs> so it was an embarrassment to it. Uh, they hauled him out of there. Uh, in our case, uh, I, I was warned about it by our, uh, our folks in, uh, in, in Hong Kong. And uh, so I, I was kind of modest about my, my gombe. But uh, at any rate, uh, we had meetings, several days of meetings, as a matter of fact. And I, I was asked to make presentations at the university there in Guangzhou. And they had no computer. They had absolutely no computers in China at that time. At least in that location, they had no computers. And I gave demonstrations of the uh, 1,000, and they were amazed at what, what this could do, and they just imagined it. One of the things that they really would like to have, a lot of people had children that they wanted to be educated in the United States. They wanted immigration. That was a big deal uh, in China at that time. And uh, they were talking a lot about immigration. But I thought things were going well. We were scheduled uh, after three or four days of meetings uh, to go to Beijing to meet with the people there. And I don't know who that would have been, but I would imagine the prime minister was gonna be involved in what they had in mind. And we were scheduled to go. And the day before we were to go, uh, Mr. Song and I, he, he leaned over to me, he was sitting to my left and he leaned over to me to whisper it in my ear. And in Timex in the gyroscope business, And I kind of froze. Yes, we were in the gyroscope business at that time. Uh, and I don't know what well, you can probably talk about this more, Joe, than, than I can, but uh, are they still in the gyroscope business, Timex? Joe? No? Me? Yeah. I don't know. I don't know anything about gyroscope business. <laughs> they were in the but, gyroscope business. They were yeah, but over here, over here, the, it completely disappeared. So only a commercial representation now. Okay, uh, the uh, uh, we were making gyroscopes at that time. Gyroscopes are the guidance systems for rockets. It turned out, in my estimation, at that time, and we were not selling those kind of products to countries that we weren't totally friendly with uh, nicely. And it was obvious to me that the interest was more in the gyroscopes than it was in the computer industry. We didn't go to Beijing. We did not go to Beijing because at that time it was illegal. I would, if I'd have been trying to negotiate something in that, that discussion, uh, it, it, it could have been something wouldn't have been good for my, uh, my career. And, uh, so we ended up packing up our goods, never signed a deal with, uh, with, with China, and we came back home. And a few months later, we announced that we were discontinuing our business. But that was a milestone, I think, in the business. We made the right decision uh, uh, for the country, maybe not the right decision for the company, but it was the right decision uh, uh, for us, and, and that was a, that was another one of the milestones that I uh, mentioned Bill Campbell being one of them. In fact, we didn't hire him. And then this particular decision uh, was a very, very big decision for the company. And uh, we ended up and I ended up from there um, in December, we, or January 
uh, 1984, we announced we were getting out of the business. I ended up going down, being uh, asked to start a venture capital firm in, uh, in Atlanta. I'd lived here with ITEL, the company I was with in the leasing business. And uh, they asked me to come down here and, and help start a venture capital firm, which I did. And I set my business up at, uh, at the Advanced Technology Development Center in, uh, at Georgia Tech. And we, uh, we funded, uh, we started 30 new companies at that, with the, that venture capital company that I started uh, in, in technology. And at that time, Georgia was an agrarian state. It was primarily in the peanut business and, and that, that was the main industry here. And uh, uh, today we are the top uh, fintech company, uh, uh, say in the uh, region in the world. We do more data uh, processing and financial technology than any other place in the world here in Georgia now. And it all loomed out of that uh, uh, incubator at Georgia Tech that, that was involved with. And uh, from venture capital, I became a, uh, uh, an inventor. Uh, this was 1998, uh, we're talking about now. And I, uh, my son and I, my son graduated from Wharton Business School. And during his final year at Wharton, uh, I said, this thing called the internet seems like it's got some legs to it. And so I said, I want you to start, you know, studying it. And we spent, a, we spent the better part of a year, 1988, 1997, 1998, studying the internet, what was working, what wasn't working, what, what what was and what should be. And we came up with technology. And as you can see, this, 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 uh, uh, if I can, right here, this, this plaque right, right here, I can get to my finger. Uh, that's one of seven patents that my son and I own on, syndicating commerce on the internet. That's the way to turn eyeballs into money. And we've uh, licensed that technology. We started the company around it. We were on 54% of the, of the uh, sites uh, when we, after we started the company. And, whoops. Yeah. We, uh, uh, we had a presence on 54% of all the uh, internet sites about 2,000 in existence at that time, selling products on sites that otherwise were primarily uh, uh, content sites. And content sites were like newspapers. They couldn't sell, uh, uh, couldn't sell their newspapers to people because people weren't willing to pay for content at that time on the internet. And uh, they were looking for ways to monetize those eyeballs and we gave them a way to do that. And today, uh, there are literally millions of transactions every day that are used using our technology to uh, to uh, uh, monetize visitors. If you look at the travel industry today, uh, companies like Orbitz and Travelocity and Priceline and these companies, they're using the technology, licensed to use the technology uh, uh, that we invented back in 1998 that really transformed the uh, internet into a way to make some, some money on it. So that's, that's what I've been doing post Timex. Just kind of segue there. Anyway, I've rambled on and if any of you have any questions or any, any <laughs> make comments on, I'd certainly uh, be happy to, to take them. So, yeah, we have, we have tons and tons of questions, um, <laughs> as you might imagine. Um, so when you, were the uh, VP and the CEO of, of Timex Computer Corporation, who, what was the relationship to the parent Timex Corporation? And I, I worked for Fred Olson. Okay, okay. And, and also, well, I said I worked for, that's who I worked for when I started, okay? Uh, Timex was interested in getting into multiple things. They got into the healthcare business too. Uh, mm -hmm. At that time, they had a they had a a product that was a a, a blood pressure measuring machine uh, that you could use in your home. 
Uh, and the scale the products that they have, they still uh, still selling those. At any rate, uh, and they brought in a, a guy that I ended up reporting into. To he was kind of the group president, I guess you'd call it at, at that time. Uh, from they brought him in from Texas Instruments. His name is Kirk Pond. Oh. Kirk, uh, Kirk, still a great friend of mine. In fact, my daughter, when we moved from from uh, uh, Middlebury, Waterbury area back to uh, to Georgia. Uh, my daughter, my oldest daughter was in her senior year at high school and we didn't want to put her into a school where last year they have to make new friends and uh, we left her there and she, she lived with Kirk Pond and, uh, and, and his family for that last year. Um, so you mentioned when we talked earlier that you had gone over and done the negotiations for Timex to get the the you know the manufacturing rights right to, for the ZX eighty one that we I don't think I, I said that I I was involved in in getting the uh, relationships I, okay. I say, but the contract that Timex was manufacturing that product uh, right okay you know they had a Dundee plant and that's kind of how the relationship really started there and then we decided it might be something we should. Red Olson decided it was something that we probably should start to sell ourselves. And, and that's when I came into it, right? Okay. And, you know, I, I have a personal theory. And that is that, uh, you know, Clive was, was really interested in his flat screen TV, right? And it seemed to me like a lot of what he did was underwriting his effort to get a flat screen TV to work. <laughs> right. Right. And was was Timex, you know, were you guys, uh, did you have some sort of, once Clive managed to sort that out, did you guys have some sort of, um, you know, a, agreement to manufacture that thing? Yeah. Okay. We obviously had a relationship with them, it's a good relationship. I, as, as far as that particular product was concerned, uh, I, I you know, no, I mean, okay. it, flat screens didn't really get, it didn't happen right? Uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a way that was, uh, it happened after we, 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 we closed our business there. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. and I'm, I remember can reading, I, can, you know, I, can okay. I add something, David? Yeah. Sorry. Uh, because, so the, the last TV set from Clive Sinclair was assembled in Dundee. Um, so the the FTV, the flat TV version from 84, I think, was assembled in D. But one thing that I have, and I can, I just need to find it to show it, is that Timex had a brochure, a flyer, about a flat TV module, which the thing I don't know if it is technologically speaking related to the one from Sinclair or not, but it's pretty obvious to me that in a certain moment in time, Timex start pitching the possibility of uh, selling uh, flat TV modules. Um, I'm not saying Timex in USA, of course, but I'm saying that that exists because I have the brochure. I can I can find it and show it in a few minutes. Very cool. That that was awesome. a second. Now. You know, we we were our products were hooked up to the television. Yeah, it was. Uh, um, this was our connectivity, <laughs> right? Yeah, the old uh, <laughs> the old RF switch box. Yep. yep. Um, and, but you know, there were there were products that were starting to come on the market uh, uh, before we closed the business up. I think they came out of uh, maybe some somebody in Pittsburgh or somewhere in that area. I think uh, developed the, the first flat screen and. You know, it was obvious that that's where the market was going. And there were, you know, like I'm sitting here talking to you now. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, that's 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 what happened. With the yeah, you don't have a monster CRT on your desk anymore. <laughs> well, I got, got one of those, but I don't. <laughs> um, when I talked to George uh, Grimm a while back, he told me um, that Bill Gates had talked to you guys about putting Microsoft Basic on on the Timex computers. Do you recall that? 
we did. I don't think those conversations went very far. Uh, right. <laughs> so, um, and when that, you guys when you guys decided decided to produce the twenty sixty eight, you know, you 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 saw the spectrum coming, right? And at some point, you made a decision to to jump on that. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. Uh, the 2068, I mean, we, we, we designed that, the, the structure of that, that, that was done by our, our technology. And yeah. uh, the, this cartridge technology, uh, that, was, that was part of the, the Timex uh, uh, technology. It came yeah. from Timex, yeah. Uh, you know, the one thing that I think Clive was very smart about, I, the functional keyboard that he developed even for the TS1, uh, the uh, Spectrum and then TS1000, uh, that, that, to me, that was a very powerful thing for him to do, you know, to be able to, to do programming by hitting a uh, patrol key in, in one stroke and you had a, you had a command there. Mm -hmm. And, and that, we, we did that on all the computers, but the, the, this and the, the Spectrum, which we turned into the 1500. Uh, you know, this one has a chiclet, uh, the 1500 has a chiclet type of a keyboard, which is one of the biggest, the biggest challenge we had with, his, with, his, with the uh, TS-1000 was, uh, was the keyboard being a <laughs> Mylar keyboard. And the, uh, the second biggest problem we had was the, uh, this connectivity right here. Yeah. <laughs> that, that was a that was a big issue because uh, it would come unplugged in the middle of a program, <laughs> so, and that, that was a, that was a big challenge we had. We fixed that problem on the uh, spectrum and the I'm sorry on the fifteen hundred and the uh, twenty sixty eight. You originally were thinking about a sixteen k RAM and a forty eight k RAM version of the. The 2068 and you had these you know various model numbers uh floated around and at one point the, the model number uh 2072 was floated um you know referring to the total amount of, of memory and then the the story goes you 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 called it in some meeting or some presentation you called it the 2068 right. and and folks were like where did that come from and and you know the, the apocryphal story is that you know you just said, you know, it just came out of my, my head and it sounds good. <laughs> Can you tell me about that? <laughs> That's exactly the case. Uh, the, the, the 20, the, it should have been the 2072, actually, right. because it was 48K of uh, onboard memory. And then the, the cartridge itself, I think, had 24K. Uh, mm -hmm. okay? And that adds up to 72. And, and, of course, the programs were, were uh, uh, operating out of this, this this cartridge. Yeah. Okay. And and this is one of the, we developed this as well. This this was a Timex development here. That little cartridge, yeah. Technology. yeah. Not... But sorry, can I complicate things even more? <laughs> okay. Because uh, in in the meantime, David, I'm uh, connected from my phone, so I can't share the document. But I sent you the brochure on the Flap TV to your uh, Facebook Messenger, if you can share oh, okay. afterwards. Okay. But uh, regarding this matter, what I wanted to complicate more was that I heard a similar story, but not mixing up 2072 with 2068. Instead, uh, the story would be, I don't know where I read it first, to be honest, uh, but it would be that the computer was going to be called 2048, but I'm talking about the same computer now. That's true. But I do have a press release that shows the computer still with a, time, with a label saying Timex Sinclair 2048. The document is from Bernie Moglever, Susan O'Sullivan, New York office Good to thing. Timex computer. Yes. Uh, I'll send the, I'll send it to David right away for him to share if he wants. That that uh, 2048 was the original number. Uh, we yeah. we we could not get and that was based on the spectrum, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, and the spectrum uh, uh, was 2048. Uh, F, the Federal Trade Commission, as I recall, we had a problem with the, with the spectrum. 
in the FTC here. And I think that yep. with that, we made a lot of modifications, including coming out with this. Okay, so we, we did a lot of, lot of good things. Uh, we had a better format, we had better uh, keyboard. Uh, it, it was a better product that we were able to introduce. But if you, if you go back and, and read or, or view that uh, video that I've made to the Boston Computer Society that I think you guys posted, yep. uh, I talked about that, that particular issue. The fact that it was originally called the 2048 that ended up being 68. Okay. Okay, that's that's the story. David, I don't know if you can show the files because as we are streaming also to YouTube, it would allow everyone to see. Yeah. So I, I sent you two things. One is that uh, press release paper that, we, but I I don't I didn't want to get the let's say the original. I I'm showing you um, um, a, a sheet from a magazine where I publish an article about this explaining this story. Oh. But you can you can use it from a ma Portuguese magazine called Spectrum which is Spectrum, basically. And the other one was the brochure on the flat uh, TV module from right. Timex. So this, this what, what you showed, I'm going to try to share my screen, but uh, what you Sorry, showed... Sorry, guys, but I, I connected from the phone, so now I don't access the, the hard drive from the yeah, phone. Yeah, yeah. Um, is a press release from Ruder... Um, Ruder fan. Thank you. And... Um, this, we saw this information in the US. We saw this information in you can you zoom know, in yeah. in in all of our meetings can i can i yes i can if you zoom um, in you can it has quality to see there we go uh and so right and for bernie mcglover right uh we saw this printed in say um creative computing and some of the other uh computing magazines at the time this information if you but if you zoom in, we, I don't know if you guys- It says 2048 on not. it. Yeah, yeah, it says clearly 2048. Okay. Yep. Just well, and, okay. but okay. also, also, Joao, uh, if you look closely at these lines that are yeah. on the keyboard, those are Sharpie. You can, you can okay. see the shakiness in the hand of whoever drew those lines, right? So this is clearly <laughs> the mock -up. You know, the, and what's really obvious is this far left line over here. It's, you know, it's really clear yeah. that this is, this is a, a you know, done with Sharpie. And drawn, and drawn kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, okay. exactly. Right. Um, and one of the things that Timex also put out um, in 83-ish was some marketing materials that had illustrations, you know, suitable for, uh, you know, newspapers or, or magazines, whatever, sort of line drawings of both the 16 and the 48. Uh, which I've uploaded to archive.org. Oh, 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 over here, we have uh, um, articles in newspapers about computers that never were produced, like the 3256, which was an advanced version in Portugal that they did not conclude. So it doesn't surprise me. It was normal practice. Everyone would do that. So Yes, yes, absolutely. And I'll, I'll show this. I'll share this uh, other one that you shared with me. Okay. This is the, uh, there it is. The so this was on the paperwork of Alvaro Oliveira, kind of, let's say, he was a consultant for Time Export, it was kind of number two over here, uh, and among many thousands of paperwork, there was this brochure from Timex about this module. What I don't know is if this module is somehow related to the one used on the Sinclair flat TV. No, because this is I, from I never 1986, from... and the flat TV is a bent... 84, 85. CR the the flat TV is a bent CRT module. Um, okay. This is this looks like okay. it's a, a some kind of an LCD maybe. Although it does say flat CRT. Um, yeah. And if you look at it, it's not so different. Yeah. And remember the the flat TV from Sinclair was assembled in Dundee. I mm -hmm. don't have doubts about mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. Okay, but that was just curiosity. <laughs> So you one, mentioned one the, the keyboard, Danny, uh, the, the difference between, you know, the keyboard on the 1500, which was inherited from the, the, the spectrum. Right. How did you guys, uh, you know, where did you arrive at that, that plastic um, keycap keyboard? And, and part of my question is their brother put out a typewriter that has an almost identical keyboard. I don't know if you were aware of that. I'm not. Probably you could ask George that okay. <laughs> uh, when, when you get him on. Uh, yeah. uh, 
I, I can't answer that question, but it, we, we, well, we, Danny, if you don't mind me, uh, stepping in here, you actually uh, answered that question in your presentation to the Boston Computer Society. Uh, when Ryan and I were watching that yesterday, you actually yeah. did say that the computer's keyboard was from a brother typewriter. Oh, yeah, okay. yeah. the point. So yeah. There you are. Yeah, you answered it for us <laughs> 40 years ago. Thank you. Oh my gosh. <laughs> we have, this is a modem. This oh my is, Lord. It's compatible modem. Uh, and it was uh, one of the dreams that I had was that we had a computer here that was inexpensive and banks at that time were trying to get new clients. And I felt that they could, in fact, attach their clients uh, to the computers. Uh, this was back, back in a time when they never, never dreamed of being able to do these kind of things, attach their clients to the computer and do some of the things that they're doing now online, uh, thanks to the internet. But this, this was kind of our uh, first version prototype, if you would, of the, oh, yeah. uh, internet, of the uh, modem, Hayes compatible modem, which was the first, of course, successful modem to be introduced. And by the way, that guy's from Atlanta, Georgia, too, where I'm at. The, the Hayes folks? Anyway. That's good. Anything else? I, I've got to drop off here in a second, but um, it, it's just, I'm, I'm just absolutely floored that there's so much interest in, in what we did 40 years ago is just a, uh, uh, I think we made a contribution to, I see so many people that had their first experience with, with computers. Yep. Uh, yep. And they, they say, my God. Then, uh, then if you, if your, if your time is, is so is limited, can I just try to throw you with two questions? Because I think they are very important to get the, get the the overall the overall picture um so and they are not technical or anything like that um Good. so one one was i heard so one was related to the withdraw of the computing business so when you guys decided to to step back from it in 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 us and what what i would like to to try to validate was somehow the reasons for it, if it was just the competition or more than that. But I'll, I'll, I'll tell you why. Everyone that I spoke always refers that as the, let's say, the, the official version. But Alvaro Oliveira, I, so before he died, I, I had a meeting with him. And in a long conversation, he told me that the story could be a little bit different. So he argued that he was very close to the people in US. That's what he claimed. And that there was an opportunity. I know this is not from the Timex Computer Corporation. It's probably from the, the, the main one. But there was supposedly someone trying to buy the distribution channel that you guys had. So as, as, a, as someone else that wanted to use it to, um, to sell computers. And so unlike what is normally said, which is Timex lost money from the computing business, it could have been a little bit different. Is there any fundament on this theory or not? Uh, I certainly wasn't involved with the, any of those discussions about the third party coming in wanting to use our channel. The reason we went out of business was the fact that when the margins went down the way they did, we, we made money initially. That, that's a misnomer to say that we didn't make money. Uh, but when the margins became such that they weren't, you know, like anything else, that it's a business decision. Uh, we had to lower our prices to the level that, uh, and you know, there were there were there were issues that we had to confront too. I mean, uh, when you introduce a new product into your distribution channel, and and, and your distribution channel has older products there, like the one thousand and fifteen hundred, they're going to want to upgrade. Their, their, their inventory. And they're going to want us to take back the products that you had. And we had to do this, some of that. We had to do some of that. And uh, we had to figure out some way to make money off of the money, the products that we took back. And we did find out how to do that. Uh, we, we, I, I contracted with a, uh, uh, with a barter company. And we uh, actually took product and, and back and we, we uh, traded uh, the product for uh, for advertising credits so that we could advertise okay. the products, okay, uh, basically. Uh, and 
the products that were we used in, in trade uh, was distributed to areas where we were not doing business, South America, for instance. Oh. Yep. Uh, and that's that's how a lot of the products got shipped down there. Uh, the the uh, that 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 was a, a huge idea. Kind of interesting, also. Uh, I got a call after I became, went into venture capital from Bill Campbell, who at the time was with Apple, and they ran through the similar type problems with uh, with the Apple II C. Uh, yeah. they, they had a distribution out there with the Apple II Cs, and he called me and said, "Tell me what you guys did." <laughs> I don't know what they did. Sent me one of the Apple II Cs that I gave to my son, who was a freshman at Georgetown at the time. He got his first computer <laughs> from Bill Campbell, which was okay. one. They ended up trading, and the company that I was doing business with for this uh, this uh, barter arrangement, uh, uh, okay. they took all these Apple II C products and they used them. Apple used them for advertising, and it, it was kind of interesting. But yeah, that 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 was the biggest challenge we okay. had. The market went down. The, the we had to take back new products, uh, products that were still in distribution, uh, and you know they they kind of had Timex by the short hairs. It was great that we had a distribution channel, but you know this disturbed our watch business too. Oh. Yeah, they yeah. were also watch customers, and there were other people from Hong Kong and and uh, Korea that were building watches that uh, that retailers had the ability to to buy at that time i mean that's why we basically entered the computer business uh yeah. is because we had distribution channels and and we had more competition in the watch business and uh but that i don't know if that answers your question or not, no 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 it answers it answers and it helps me to to try to put the pieces uh, all together we we try in the museum in portugal uh, one thing I, I explain to people is that we keep learning, and so every time we learn some new details, we try to update our our baseline baseline to ensure we have the most up to date story. The final question is very simple to me. The final from me is um, so you mentioned a lot uh, Bill Gates and Steve Jobs before. Now Alvaro Oliveira did mention the uh, participation in a certain conference uh, in US. I, I never found which conference it was where they were, uh, the three of us, but mostly uh, the conversation was with Bill Gates and where supposedly Bill Gates said in public that the merit of putting computers in our houses was not from Microsoft, was from Timex and Sinclair. Are you aware of this ever being said? Because this is, I think, very important, of course. Well, you know, we certainly, I mean, uh, Apple sold its computers for business reasons. Yeah. Atari and Commodore sold their business, their, their computers for entertainment. Uh, and we really had some serious, I mean, look, see, if you look at some of these labels here, uh, household budgeting. I mean, these are the basic rudimentary things that people weren't doing at the time. This is a home application. And I do think that we led the path to go into that marketplace. I mean, Clive was right with his vision to have a, a uh, serious computer here, not a game computer. Although, you know, obviously with the, with the 28, uh, we, we introduced games. And because that's, we wanted to make sure we, we had market beyond what our original vision was. But uh, that's, I think, I never heard Steve or Bill Gates. Uh, uh, Bill, yeah. Bill Gates okay, made. so you never heard it, but it, it's aligned with what, what happened. Yeah, I, I, I agree think, with that. I mean, if you, if, I mentioned Ben Rosen. Ben Rosen always felt that Timex's interest in the computer business, the over that the lasting uh, impact is going to have is going to be helpful to uh, Apple and IBM at that time. And I might say this too. IBM, I think, made the biggest mistake ever made in the computer industry. I knew that Estridge, Don Estridge, who headed that division, I knew him too. He was part of this uh, consortium. And Don Estridge felt that the time to market was the most important thing. They had to get there before Apple was able to take over the entire marketplace. And in doing that, he gave away two things. He gave away the software because it was an open system. 
and he gave away the chip to Intel. The two places that make money, everything else was a commodity. And that's why they're not in business today. I mean, that was a huge mistake. He thought, felt they needed to get to the market today. And the way to get there was use other people's technology. Apple, on the other hand, used proprietary technology. And, and that's why they, where they, where they are today. Very well, thank you. Danny, can I, can I impress upon you to stay a few more minutes to answer some questions from other folks? You bet. Okay. So folks, use the, uh, the hand raising thing with the reactions at the bottom of your Zoom screen. The, David, let me just tell you, we also have a couple of questions in the YouTube chat if you want to check it or not. One was about uh, uh, Nigel Searle and there was some others. Uh, so there. just for you to know. Okay. okay. But please moderate. Okay, Nigel. Uh, Nigel was our, in, he was our intermediary between Clive and, uh, and Timex. Uh, I think Nigel is now living in Florida. <laughs> yes, he is. He is. And uh, I spoke to Nigel a couple of years ago. In fact, when Clive died. And, uh, uh, you know, he's, he was a tremendous guy for us. He was a, a big help. He was a guy that could translate what Clive was thinking into words that we understood. <laughs> <laughs> um nice. Stuart, you're up you want to unmute yourself yeah hi danny hey, I, um, I had a tiny company i formed in 1983 i was an electrical engineer and uh i had four prior jobs like in the aerospace but i formed this company to support the timex ts1000 dx81 because i thought you know this was going to be so much fun i always liked electronics as a hobby I looked into um, Brooklyn Closeout Corporation, Mr. Freed, and I think you almost half answered the question I had, what that relationship was like, because I got lucky in that after Timex started to pull out, Mr. Freed was getting some Timex surplus stuff, um, but the Timex stuff was small for him. He used to have, I used to be there when 40-foot trailers would pull up with probably this kind of product you were talking about, maybe an old alarm clock or other Timex product that was a probably a past model. And his claim to fame, I guess, um, actually his, he wasn't famous. The whole point of his business was he could take this product and ship it out of the US market to people he knew, he was an Orthodox Jew and he knew Orthodox Jews in like South Africa and South America. And he was the least technical person. He had no idea what a computer or most of the stuff he sold was, but he knew he could sell it for more than he bought it for. That's the only question he needed answering. <laughs> so anyway, do, do you remember that, that organization? Did that ever come up? As far as your concern, Brooklyn, we dealt with a. Uh, we dealt with a. It, it was a, a fairly large uh, barter company that we we dealt with. That we, we and 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 quite frankly, I, I tried. To, you know, when we were trying to find a solution to this, what how, what are we going to do with this inventory? Uh, you know, we needed. We knew we needed to turn it into cash. We needed to turn it into something that we could. Uh, uh, could use and advertising was the thing we could use and this was something that to trade one for the other that this was kind of like uh, giving the arms out of your sleeves out of your vest uh, and and but what we wanted to make sure was that it didn't end up coming back to compete with us and that's why it had to go it had to go out of the country and that's probably what mr Freed did. this isn't the same free that that the uh that the uh uh uh, the the, the uh, uh, money deal, like the FTX, is it? Uh, no, no, I don't believe. It. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, not the current one. No, uh, <laughs> probably no relate direct. Well, the family tree, maybe. Uh, and the other question I had was, uh, can you comment at all on a repair center in? Uh, was Timex running a repair center in Connecticut? Because at some point. I bought a lot of stuff from either Sinclair or Timex when it, when they finally got rid of the repair parts. Not that I'm aware of. Okay. All right. 
So people who built those kits and had a problem with them, did they send them back somewhere? Uh, I think those went to yeah. Arkansas, didn't they? Little well, Rock. Yes, I think that's right. Yeah. Oh, okay. All right. Uh, Thank you. Danny, one of the things that, that people have an undying curiosity about is the bus expansion unit for the 2068. I don't know if you recall this thing, but it was going to, it would have a, you know, another cartridge slot in it and it would have four expansion ports inside for expanding the memory and potentially hooking up either a stringy floppy, you know, like the micro drive or a real floppy disk. Yeah, I, that, that, the micro drives. <laughs> <laughs> oh, do, do spill the tea. <laughs> I mean, we, we had those. I, I didn't talk about those. Uh, quite frankly, uh, uh, I came into the marketplace uh, when probably the first, uh, first way of uh, uh, storing data was on, a, on a, a tape, but it wasn't an endless tape like the micro drive was. That was, he tried to integrate the, 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 a tape system and a disk system. <laughs> it, it wasn't the most elegant thing he did, I might say. <laughs> I'll just leave it there. So, and, but Joelle was showing me some, some, you know, documentation and, and actually I went back and looked at some of the drawings that, uh, that Gary uh, Grimes did. Um, and one of the, one of Gary's drawings illustrated a, a bus expansion unit with a couple what might have been floppy drives on it and then it's something else on top of that um and joao showed me some you know some documentation that showed that a fair amount of thinking had been done on that on that product do you have any idea how far along it got in terms of, of building it no okay Okay. And uh, David, if I may, because in that document we saw uh, w w the thing that kind of surprised us was the reference to at least the Portuguese team was talking about to the drawings of John Maliscus. Um, is this a name that Dan Danny remembers? And is uh, was he close? No, doesn't remember. Okay. Okay, we need to keep digging in that part. <laughs> <laughs> Um, anybody else want to ask a question? Adam, oh, so let, let, let me just uh, oh, uh, sorry, very quickly, Danny. Uh, and you, you, you asked about Tony Gomes. Uh, I, I gave to you one or two other names. Anyone else you remember interacting with uh, no, he, uh, the Portuguese unit in, uh, in, 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 in Portugal? Yeah, but no, nobody else I, I can think of right now. Okay, no problem. Forty no problem. is a long time. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> Adam, you had a question? Uh, I do. Uh, we've been asking a lot of technical questions. Um, I was hoping maybe we could uh, look back at like your time that you spent at Timex and how you just feel about it generally. And if you're proud of like what the computers were able to do by accomplishing, like getting out to people uh, for, like you've said a few times, for under $100. And um, how do you feel that was an impact on the other computers of the industry? You did say it started the cottage industry, for instance, and like uh, Texas Instruments had to lower their prices and so did Commodore. Um, and do you think that, uh, how, does, how do you feel about all that in general in, in your place in the history of uh, computers? Well, let me just make a comment about Texas Instruments and, and, and Commodore dropping their prices. Texas Instruments, we, they dropped their price down to $99 of computer that initially sold for $250, $300. And we took that product apart piece by piece and priced it out. And in quantities of 100,000, uh, the piece part cost more than what they were selling the product for. Their whole strategy was that they were gonna make their money on software and that never, never materialized. And, and that, that was the mistake that they made. It's interesting, none of these companies are in the business today. Neither Coleco, neither Commodore, neither uh, TI, none of the companies are in the business today. And it's, it's all, I did a, a, a speech to a, a Future Computing, which is, it was at the time a big spokesperson for this industry. And in that speech, I talked about kamikaze mark, uh, uh, pricing. And that's basically what they were doing. They were they were lowering their prices to a level that 
what doesn't make sense. Uh, they thought they could, and, and they, they, their model was the, the Gillette razor blade. You there give you them go. the handle and make you money on the blade. And that strategy didn't work very well. And Danny, um, Kirk came from TI. He came from TI. T and, Kirk, Kirk's a friend of mine. I like Kirk a lot. And, and so did Rex Naden, uh, who. Rex, you see the was was very involved in that computer. Yeah, thanks for sending those. Uh, uh, we, Rex and I, uh, I, I have fond memories of, of Rex. Uh, we used to have meetings with with uh, Fred Olson at, at his place in uh, in Scotland. He had a he had a state up there called uh, Forest, and Forest was a just what the name says. It was a lot of trees on thousands of acres of land. And he had a cottage up there that was really a castle. And it was an amazing place. Uh, Fred, Fred's family came out of Norway and they had a lot of money going into the watch business. And, and uh, uh, you know, he, he, he was a very interesting character himself. But between Fred, I'm not sure who was more interested, Fred or Clive. They, 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 in many ways, they were cut from the same tape. Uh, people like Rex Naden and and uh, Kirk Pond. These are people that uh, Rex, Rex uh, you know, came out of TI. They, they were in the watch business also, by the way. But at uh, any rate, uh, I appreciate you sending me Rex's contact information. <laughs> um, Danny. Thank you very much for your time. Uh, I hope you'll come back. I, I, uh, I hope to, and, and if there's anything you need or going forward, you know, feel free to pass my uh, email address out and I'm happy to continue the conversation, uh, if not online like this, but, but with email. And, and uh, I'm just delighted that there's such interest in, in this. And uh, it, it means a lot to me it, it, when you, I think we've made a contribution to to the industry. Oh. Uh, maybe not the way we had hoped it would turn out, but and at the end of the day, I think we we made it we made a difference in this marketplace. And and you guys continuing the work that you're doing here are certainly uh, uh, making that uh, e even longer lasting than what we did. Yeah, and yeah. I appreciate that. You, you're uh, absolutely correct. You made a, a huge you. mark. A huge mark, <laughs> obviously on us, <laughs> but you know, on on a yeah. lot of people who aren't who aren't even here, who's you know, uh, who's entry into the you know computer science industry is is hinged on that computer, you know. Uh, so yeah, thank you, thank you for doing that, and yeah. thank you for coming. And um, <clears throat> we will certainly have follow up questions, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> thank you so much thank you um joao do you want yeah you want to talk a little bit about some of the things that we actually you know just talked about um and i'm gonna let's see if yeah we start. we had um we had uh, some questions also going on in the chat but uh, i i asked people to to understand that we had a very limited time so We'll we'll try to deal with anything that we can to answer afterwards, as as he suggested. So I think we we have we we have a strategy. Uh, so yes, um, so uh, whatever. I don't know if you want to if you want to go to the to the to the bus expansion unit and then you can show that document uh, or whatever you want to do, David. I'll I'll leave it up to you. Uh, well, a lot of folks have you know questions about that bus expansion unit, uh, yeah. and I am manually going through and asking each of you to unmute because I can't. I don't know how to do it in 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 mo you know in mass. So <laughs> can I ask a, a question of? Uh, to, to everyone here and to David, maybe specifically, since you, you have so much general knowledge about um, what, what uh, was talked about and something, maybe you all knew this, I didn't know this. It almost seems like to me, he said something, and I'm not sure if I took this the wrong way, but did he say basically that they decided not to sell the Timus computers anymore because they would have had to sell gyroscopes to the Chinese, that was kind of the exchange there. And he basically is like, so since we couldn't keep the cost down, I mean, he didn't say that explicitly, but is that what he meant? Well, no, so no, that, that was specific about China. 
Right. I right, understand right. that. But like, since he was t the company, I mean, were they, they were going to be able to s sell it for such a small, pr uh, for less money. Like, was that what he was insinuating there? Well, that he right. So he was talking in, in terms of, you know, they had factories, as he said, you know, Dundee, Portugal, and Korea, right? And the France, uh, they did go to China to look for, um, you know, to do manufacturing there because the cost of manufacturing was super, super low, cost of labor. And um, he, he wrote a little uh, description about this on his Facebook page that was a little bit more detailed. And, you know, basically, as he said, they, they went through several days worth of, of, you know, meetings and whatever. And then this guy says to him, so, you know, you guys make gyroscopes, right? Because that's what, and, 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 and he's, like he said, you know, he froze and, and his interpretation, I think his interpretation was absolutely correct was, and he says this in his Facebook post was that they weren't, China was not interested in, in the computer. China was interested in gyroscope yeah. right and yep. at that point he's like mm, no we're out <laughs> literally yeah. i mean they did not go to beijing right um and so that was uh part of it right and then the other yeah. part of that is that as you know the as the retail price came down their wholesale price you know what they what they could get uh you know in terms of the wholesaling came down but the cost of manufacturing did not come down and so, you know, they were, in essence, a victim of their own pricing success. Yeah. But, <laughs> but you know, David, uh, for example, and I think this makes it more clear to me over here uh, about um, why, why is it uh, for you guys over there, it seems it was some kind, it was kind of strange that they kept going in Portugal and if it was done with permission or not. I think this is pretty obvious because that that price reduction was in U.S. So that was a context of the U.S. market. So That's Timex right. decided, OK, the U.S. market no longer makes sense, which was the biggest one, of course. But the, the other guys that were in markets that were more protected didn't have this issue. They kept going. And that's why we kept going in Portugal, I would say. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And so and so to your point, Joao, you know, the, the at the time, the folks who had a little bit of information were sort of doing this tea leaf reading, right? Um, when uh, was it Tony came over to the US to try to, uh, you know, get some products certified, uh, you know, the, 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 it was sort of a mystery about the relationship there, right? Um, you know, wh where, where did this guy come from? Who is this Portugal place? And, you know, nobody had any information. Stuart went to Portugal, uh, you know, and there was that's, another... That's years later. Right? Years, right, right, exactly. Stuart can clarify that, but I think it's years later. Exactly, yes. Yeah. But, you know, in, in 84, when, when Tony, you know, wanted to try to, you know, keep selling, keep selling the stuff, uh, you know, the question was, you know, who is this person? And yay! <laughs> It's yeah, still being made well, somewhere. <laughs> but the thing is, they they were yeah they were they were doing it together for many time. I I, I understand, and I showed you yesterday, for example, the the reorganization of the computing uh, department that yeah. Lou Gailey sends. And uh, obviously, the guys in Portugal were not directors in U.S. Uh, computing business, but they were kept informed they were reporting to people in that team so they were working together very closely but this is in the computing because i have other examples for example i told you about the electroluminescence technology yes. which was being which was being done directly with uh, with the olson family and guys in us so outside of the computing business so there were many interactions um but um, and so i think it, i don't know for, for us over here this was more or less normal to to keep going, and I understand it better now because of the reason why they they left the market. Yeah. Well, you know, to you know, I I want to get it a little more nuanced that you know that the spectrum really didn't come here, right? They they Timex was probably going to do that, and they probably would have lasted a little longer because they would have had some cash to to deal with that. But they, you know, I mean, we all know that the reasons why the spectrum really didn't wasn't going to fly in the U.S., right? 
so there's all this development cost of the of the 2068, right? They started this apparently, you know, talking to Grimes and, you know, in early 83, right? Maybe late 82, early 83. So you have to look at how much, when did they start selling the 1000 for $99 and were making, right? They were making 70 bucks a unit, right? If it cost 20 bucks to make and they were selling it wholesale for, what did he say, 65 bucks? You know, that's, that's yep. 50 bucks at least, right? That's a pretty good margin when you're selling, you know, you know, tens of thousands of these things. But, you know, the that market, I think really, like you said, uh, TI dropped their price, oh, right? Oh. TI dropped their price and, you know, Commodore didn't go, go that deep, but, um, uh, you know, their margins were really, I think, taking a hit in, in 83, right? Here they are too, developing this whole new product. So think about all the costs for the development of the 2068, right? Where's that, where's that money coming from to develop that product? Right, it's coming from dwindling 1,000 and 1,500 sales. Right, not only that, but when it came out, it was it was not fully baked. Right, we we all kind of know that. Right, yeah. they needed yep. to come out with it so that they could have something to sell to make make that profit. Right, and I think it just got to the point where, uh, you know, it just you, you can't squeeze a you know turn up only so much, and then you know the the development cost for the 2068 and the way the computer market was going at the time. And I think that's probably kind of why, you know, Timex decided at least here in America to pull out, right, it, I think. Carl, it's funny what you're saying, because in a way I see a resemblance with the QL, uh, probably the QL with more manufacturing problems. Yeah. But, uh, but I see a lot of a resemblance with the story of the QL. Yeah, especially in Britain, right? For Because that's that really never, came here to the US, at least not not in a Timex guys, right? Obviously Sinclair was selling them directly, but still, yeah, you're right. It was just such but an Timex expensive Portugal, computer. But, mm -hmm. but Timex Portugal was, I, I'm not sure if I should be proud of this, but uh, Timex Portugal was collaborating on some things on the QL, at least some testing, because I have letters, memos between Timex and uh, and uh, and Sinclair about delays on the on the validation of the of the system. So mm -hmm. and that's something that even I forget. It's very often I I don't think about the QL and think about Timex, but the fact is that there was some some collaboration. Yeah. Uh, another thing we couldn't another thing we couldn't address in this call because it didn't make sense. But it's I think it's something very very interesting, which is the connection between uh, Sinclair, and I mean Sinclair, the inventor, and his endeavors, and Timex, kept somehow strong. And I'll give you an example. Uh, there's a cordless phone created by, sold by a company in UK called Shea Communications, which started the technology, the beginning of the technology, was initially developed at Sinclair Research, and then they spun it off. Uh, and I have a book saying that Sinclair, Clive Sinclair invested on it, but Timex also, Timex and Fred Olson invested on it. Uh, so I think independently of what happened to the, to the Amstrad deal and all of that, I think there were indeed some interesting, I, I, I look at it from the outside and I think, okay, Clive Sinclair had ideas, came up with the prototypes and the vision and the product and, and Timex would, would be investing on it like a venture capital or something like that. I, I think this, this has some background to support so, it but joel um two things uh timex was a you know used their manufacturing facilities to make things for other folks right um they made the polaroid uh they manufactured the polaroid camera for polaroid you know that instant camera right they also manufactured this crazy thing from the early 80s called the nims low which was a three i know, camera, it, I know it. little four lenses in the front right but but and what, what was that? Timex was a camera? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a camera oh, okay. that yeah. shots twice. 3D. It shots Lenticular. Four sensors. Yeah. Yeah. But you know, David, I don't think the investment. So they manufactured it, mm -hmm. but there was investment on that camera. On that camera, but from what I read, not from Timex, but from Fred Olson. Yeah, makes sense. I read. Yeah, I read yeah. about that. Yeah, I have the camera because someone mentioned it to me, and I I bought it to the museum. And and Gustavo the, has a question for you, Joao. I'm, I'm no, have, or you have to ask him to unmute again because of the way this. Hi. 
Hello, Joao. Thank you for participating with this meeting. Hi, Gustavo. Also, hi, hello. And I'm also, I keep contact with, with Hugo Pinto in the museum. We oh, yeah, yeah, my, my colleague. Made, yes, 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 yes. Yes, correct. Yes. And also, and also say to you my greetings because uh, your help to keep in contact with, with, with the museum. Okay. I, I like the, the web the site and also the, the, the presentation that you you made in three languages, three different languages, English, uh, Portuguese, and Spanish. That will be great. And also, I don't know, I have a, a question for, for you uh, because we are very close with the Brazil. Brazil is the next country in the north of Argentina. And there, you know, the, uh, some clones machine were made. Micro digital, uh, yes. Micro digital, correct. And also two of those machines were imported in Argentina, especially the TK90 and 95. Uh, yep. those, those machines was made uh, with some help from Portugal or not? Or no, uh, <laughs> so, you know, guys, um, I think uh, th it's very interesting this, um, this question, but let me just say one thing, Gustavo. I think we are all, because of the language, we are all living in different world, worlds. And I think my job is to try to bridge everyone together. So <laughs> two weeks ago, I was in a session with Mr. Ugu Maser, who was the founder of Cerveni in Argentina, in Paraná. Uh, and he told the story. So it was a, a friend of mine from Uruguay that organized this. And a little bit like today, he invited me to be there. And I was very interested because Timex, Portugal, worked with these guys in Argentina, Serbeni, but to create the CZ1000, CZ1500, and CZ2000, which is the spectrum, basically. But then the guys in Argentina kept developing locally uh, those computers. Now, uh, there was no connection. There were con contacts, but there was no um, role of Timex in what happened in micro digital in Brazil. Uh, so no, it, it didn't exist. Even the connection between Timex Portugal and Argentina, I have to say that is not as uh, strong as I, I would like it to be. The fact is that the deal was made between um, Cerbeni, uh, this Mr. Mazar and his associate Oscar Kripa, we, which uh, already dead, passed away. Uh, but so they did the deal, let's say directly with Sinclair, but because of the war between the UK and Argentina, they could not have a commercial relationship. So they did it through Portugal. Portugal. Uh, but it was more or less like this. So no connection in terms of manufacturing with Brazil. Uh, I do know that everyone fight to get uh, ULAs from Ferranti because they are used in some of the machines. Even the guys in Portugal, the commercial director, he told me that he went to Brazil to check if they could get ULAs because the problem was, for example, for you to have an idea, in Portugal, the, um, the ULAs would come from Ferranti or Sinclair, I don't know, but they were counted and you needed to deliver this number of machines back. So, and they needed machines to yeah. sell elsewhere. So they needed to find a way to get ULAs uh, and somehow let's say smuggle them. I'm, I'm joking, but you get the idea. And that's why developing the local computers, the Timex computer 2048 and 2068, which use an SCLD developed in Portugal made it easier for them to keep selling computers even when Amstrad bought Sinclair. Cool. Thank you. Well, and hey, that, that kind of brings up a thing. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Uh, I, I, um, so speaking of the ULA, um, it, that was uh, brought up in that uh, Boston computer meeting as being the specific part that would not pass the FCC. Did you, I don't know if anyone else caught yes. on to that, but I didn't realize that. I've, I've always read that it's like the board and stuff like that, but it was that very specific part. I That's think there awesome. was issues with the uh, with the um, with the ULA from Ferranti for the FCC certification, but I don't know details. I I haven't gone through all the paperwork. We have to see if we have something explaining that better. To be very honest, I don't I don't know more for now at least. 
Uh, well, by the next meeting, you'll have read all that. So. <laughs> so, so sorry, I, I was in mute. Okay, thank you very much for your explanation. It's very clear. And also my question was focused on the ULA. Exactly, that's why I asked you, because I don't know how Sarbeni made the computers is uh, to buy the the so, ULA, yes, directly from UK yes, or so Gustavo, no, uh, let me let me think. Um, so uh, the, the Ferranti one, uh, the, sorry, the Micro Digital from Brazil one was recreated, was reverse engineered by uh, a guy called Claudio Cassens, who was part of the um, of the session I was in Uruguay. So it's very easy to, to have access to that explanation, but that's for the Brazilian one. Now, regarding what they did in Argentina uh, with, the, um, with their own ULA after, so th the first ones were coming from Portugal. They had Ferranti ULAs, that was normal. Afterwards, they started developing. They never developed, as far as I remember, they never developed the ULA in, in Argentina. So what happened was that, I remember Mr. Hugo Masser saying this. He said that in the beginning, they would buy the computer uh, uh, complete. Afterwards, they would just buy the ROM or, uh, or in the ULA, or they also bought keyboards, rubber keyboards from Brazil. So they used some rubber keyboards from Brazil in the Argentina machines. Then eventually, they launched the final version in Argentina with ULAs from Spain, from Investronica, from a machine called the Invest 64, which is a clone that Investronica had developed after Amstrad took over. So bottom line, no ULA developed in Argentina as far as I remember. I don't think I'm mistaken, but it's easy oh. to confirm in the video. Okay, perfect. The next question is, uh, when Timex closed the, the computer division in US, after that, uh, all the material or, or the, I don't know, the, the circuits or, or the project was moved to, to Portugal or not, or was discarded? So, uh, David, feel free to interrupt me. I don't want this. I'm not the one being interviewed, but I'll give my, my feedback on that. I yeah, think, yeah. Uh, Gustavo, I think we are looking at the problem on the wrong way because Remember that the computers were not being assembled in US. So the 2068 the Timex Sinclair was assembled in South Korea and all the others were assembled more or less in, they were assembled in Portugal. So the, 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 the parts, most of them would be already in Portugal. Now, regarding what happened to any uh, 2068 machines made in South Korea, where did they end up? I don't know. And it was not in Portugal because we did not uh, sold them over here, the 2068 American one. Um, so but, so I, I think this is the answer. Stuart, what do you the think? Other Where do you think those things, the 2068s ended up? Oh, I have no idea. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> not at Brooklyn? Well, some of them went well, to South America for sure because yeah. they end up in South America, but I don't know how many. Yeah. But so what John think... said was, is, is the way it was. There was no manufacturing in Connecticut to shut down or in the United States. Yep. They were always made in Scotland or in Portugal or South Korea. Yeah, because yeah, it seems to me that once Timex America, you know, pulled out, obviously Portugal, Timex Portugal kept going, right? Yeah. So there must have been some technical, uh, to, you know, I'm a technical guy. So there must have been some technical development people that were at Timex Portugal to technically develop the machines, uh, right? Carl, you probably weren't on the, the first session that I participated. I think we covered it a little bit, but I have no doubt about that. I think the main difference we had between the, the Timex Scotland and the Timex Portugal was that they set up an R&D facility over here. Mm -hmm. And so, for example, in the, in the, for example, I don't know if you guys know this, but we spoke about this before. Uh, talking about the 1500 that you guys, I think, like a lot. And there were several versions of the 1500. There's a, a project called Cost Reduction TS mm -hmm. 1500 at Timex that I have many documentation for it. And if we, if we start seeing, we have at least three or four different versions of the 1500. You have a bigger main board. You have a mm -hmm. smaller one. You have one with Paranta ULA. You have one with NCR. Um, so 
all of that at many iterations. I have no doubt, because I know the guys, I have no doubt that we had an R&D facility here. And for example, one of the most uh, important uh, research institutes in this country uh, is called INESC, started 40 years ago. One of the first things they did were SCLDs for the TS-2068, TS-2048, Timex Terminal 3000, and many other things they were planning. So, yes, there was that cap yeah. capability over here. And also remember that even though the computers were being thought in the beginning, designed in US, mm -hmm. uh, the 1500 is initially developed in the Cupertino, I think, the, the concept and all that, but it's assembled in Portugal. Right. But so remember that guys from Portugal would go very often to the US and, and collaborate. So I have thousands of documents with the name of Lou Gailey, Vitor Schiff, some of the names we mentioned today, I, I showed a few to, to David yesterday. So, yeah, so that's that's a, a story that we are all um, trying to bring back. Right, right. So that begs a question as far as I'm concerned as to the, the development of the SCLD. Is there any, like I said, are there blueprints of the SCLDs from Timex Portugal, right? Because I, I know we had one, like I said, I had physical, con, you know, ones for the ones for the U.S., uh, when I develop yeah. my cartridge, but um, I'm sure there's something similar, or maybe it's easier to get to in Portugal. Look, um, <laughs> no, the, your question is very, very relevant, and uh, I'm laughing just because I, I knew that question had to come up. So let me, I won't give you a, um, a direct answer because I don't have it, and I'm not skilled enough, technically speaking, to tell you. What I do know is this I got from a couple of Timex engineers over here, files um, with lots and lots of paper. And they said, these are the timings for the SCLD, blah, blah, blah. And when you start reading it, um, I thought they were for the Portuguese version that in the meantime, we reverse engineering in the museum, not me, uh, some friends of mine that know how, how to do it. But so in the end, um, I, I think even though there are thousands of papers, I never saw something that someone tells me, these are the blueprints of the SCLD. You have it here. So every time I find something, it ends up being like that uh, document that exists in US about the SCLD. There's a, a huge file about it. I, I remember seeing it was printed. It says something like printed by, it's some time, time. Um, it's not Time Magazine, but it's something like it. So there, there, there. Time designs. So time design, yeah, that's it. Time Precisely, designs, sorry. yeah. Yeah, so eventually I end up all the time with that because what you need to understand is this. So for these guys that were doing it back in the days, sometimes they, they, they refer to the ZX81 uh, schematic as being the beginning of the spectrum. So it's obviously incorrect, but what they meant is the concepts are similar. All the, so in the end for their um, work, um, all of that is, the basis of what they had to do. So now let me just add this, this detail. More than looking for the blueprints of the SCLD, we've been looking for technical documentation of other things from Portugal, specifically the TENET, which is the Timex Educational Network System, which we are working at. Uh, so there will be news, I hope, this year about that. And the 3256, which, in the beginning was called 2256, just like what happened with the TS-2068. So I have some paperwork about the computer. This computer was never launched, was with 256Ks of uh, memory. Um, but so uh, it, it also had another name. We have paperwork showing it. Um, and, uh, and so we've been also looking for that and they gave us some documentation that it's not with me now, it's one of my uh, more technical colleagues. Uh, so there are some details. I don't know if the full blueprints exist. I don't know. Mm. Uh, real quick, Stuart, you have a question? Uh, well, I just wanted to add to, um, well, Carl's questioning about what technical skills were there in Portugal. Um, they were running a manufacturing plant and often a significant amount of work goes into test equipment for a product, not the product that leaves the door, but how to test it 
so that every little thing that's wrong with one on a production line doesn't go into the scrap heap. <laughs> you, have, you know, if you have a burn-in room, which I saw for disk drives, it's because you have a failure rate. You don't need a, a burn-in room if there's a zero failure rate, but you have one. So when they do fail, based upon their history of watching them, they would have test jigs and they would know a lot of these pro products quite intimately in order to do the quality control and make test jigs and, and you know and run a production line. Um, it's coming. Stuart, one, one thing one thing that exists over here is uh, there's a peripheral internal from Timex uh, Portugal. It's referred on the TC2048 technical document, which is uh, kind of a, a tester of the computer uh, for quality control. That exists and we have it working. Uh, so it was coded. There's the name of the programmer. It's someone from Portugal. It tests joystick ports, uh, ULA or SCLD, all the kind of things, the keyboard, all that. So they, they had that. And we have some of the working um, devices uh, in, the, in the museum. The ROMs were preserved. I, I, I promised already we were going to, to make them available. Uh, the only problem we've been fighting internally is a matter of effort and capacity to deal with all of this, but we want to do it. I have no interest on keeping them to myself. It makes no sense. So uh, we want to do it, uh, but those ROMs exist and we will share it. But just a yeah. part of the book. And, and that just goes to so show that, you know, like I said, there were technical people in Portugal because they obviously yeah. made their own SCLD. Right, the 2048 and the 2068 yep. have a PAL version SCLD, which has nothing, is totally different than, well, I mean, functionally, it's pretty much the same, but, you know, it's a and different it's design. And it's not PAL, it's, it's just, just with right. a it can go back, yeah, back from and PAL forth. to NTSC, yeah. But it just allowed them to go into more markets, right, with PAL and NTSC yep. as opposed yep. to the American version, yep. which was NTSC only, right? So they had and to have somebody develop that SCLD, no, plus no, no. all the circuit all, board, right? The circuit yeah, board's the, the, different. The, <laughs> the PSU is 9 volt, like the Spectrum. It's not 15 right. volts, like right. the, the US right. version. Yeah, yeah. The, P, the, the printed circuit board's totally different. Well, not totally different, but, you know, the only the, thing that's the same is the casing, right? The yeah, case yeah, is and, pretty and, much and, the same. And not when it, it's pretty much the same, but the cartridge, cartridge is, is fast, uh, different. Is, is, it's better, yeah. Right. Uh, yeah. And one, one thing they did in the 2048, which I find very interesting, is that they, they switched back to uh, a Kempston joystick, which was, at least <clears throat> in Portugal, was the standard kind of mm. thing. Um, so in the 2048, they did that, and they put the, the ROM from Sinclair, which made it 99, 99% right. compatible. Yeah. Hey, so we have... A little over five minutes left. I want to yeah. um, thank everybody for showing up, and uh, especially Joao. You know, you've yeah. been incredibly, incredibly helpful and informative. Um, and I just want to tell everybody that that Joao and I are, are talking about trying to do a lot more coordinating and uh, you know cross pollinating, so that we can learn more about what happened in Portugal. So we can learn more about you know. Uh, the, the folks who you know made our computers and um and you know the what happened and the you know where did this you know this this craziness uh he's showed me a few uh documents which i, I i'm just gonna say that they're mind-blowing <laughs> they really are it's astounding um and so we're gonna we're gonna work together to to get some of that stuff out you know so you guys there can will get your be minds news. blown as well yeah. um <clears throat> yeah. and uh, the other thing I want to mention is um, George uh, George Grimm, who we know for Grimm's Fairy Trails, uh, will be joining us. Um, I think I think it's I think it's the March sixth meeting. Um, George was actually more than just Grimm's Fairy Trails at Timex. Uh, when he started there, he was one of their mainframe uh, programmer guys. Uh, and he wrote, you know, business apps and stuff like that uh, for for Timex, the the parent corporation. And then when, you know, Timex Computer Corporation started, he was one of the folks that that um, got pulled into that. And that document that um, was shared with us a few months back, the uh, third party, you know, software developers guide for the uh, 
for the for the 2068 if you go to the last page on that document you'll see it's you know there's a form in there as, as a person who's you know writing a program and you're supposed to send your thing to timex and george is the name on that form um so he's going to join us uh and he has a lot of funny stories <laughs> he, he has he has a lot of funny kind of cynical stories um and and his last time i talked to him his take was you guys are still interested in this stuff <laughs> you know, yes. we hear that a lot from people from back in that time period. They, they just yeah. don't understand. Uh, and and hope, they, hope they don't make that question in thirty years. <laughs> right, exactly. Um, and then the other thing that uh, we've we've got a couple of other guests, you know, between now and uh, up to about about mid April. Um, but the other person that I talked to just yesterday was Chuck Durang, and. If you pull out your 1000 manual or your 2068 manual, he's author. the guy. Yeah. He's the author. Mm -hmm. And oh, nice. he's got a lot of interesting stories to tell as well. It was very amusing talking to him last night because he was like, well, I don't, I don't think I have very much to say. And I'm like, mm, I think you probably do. David, <laughs> the best interview I made on the 40th anniversary of the Spectrum was was a late one uh, so we got it a few days before with professor steve vickers so he was oh, the yeah. one adapting the, mm -hmm. the rom for the spectrum at the, the company called nine tiles yes uh but he he was also the creator of the manual and the fact is that he's probably the person that has more responsibility on the on the on the fact many of us became programmers because of the quality of the manual of the spectrum i'm talking about of yeah, yeah. that spectrum uh that even taught you how to put um, assembly and things like that made the difference and so perhaps the same will happen with the with us well, and and so to your, to your point right uh chuck and i were, were talking about this and he he kind of fell into you know into the um the sinclair timex side uh by accident um he uh he was in the publishing industry writing you know and organizing technical manuals for for other stuff uh but he uh he bought a zx80 uh because he felt like he didn't know very much about you know computers and it's like he, this thing came out it was 200 bucks he's like yeah i'm gonna get one of these i'm gonna learn some stuff and he ended up um meeting up with with nigel searle uh because you know he was in boston and, and they were in boston and nigel said you know would you be willing to help us with with this manual for you know the american manual for the zx81 and I, i'm not going to give too much away here except that you know he made a very interesting observation about the difference between uh computer folks in in the uk and and in america you know the yeah. folks in the uk are you know very much tinkerers right whereas the general american computer audience was not Right, and so there had to be this kind of translation uh, that had to happen, and that's what he did. Um, and then he shared with me some some uh, a very good point, which is, uh, you know, and we probably don't remember this is at the time when you know computers were reviewed. One of the things that uh, a lot of reviews said was the manual sucks. <laughs> And um, a lot of the things, a lot of the reviews of the 1000 and the 2068 said, the manual is great. This is what manuals should look like. <laughs> um, so he was, he's um, very interesting. Uh, he'll be on, uh, on us, uh, with us on April 16th. OK. I have a theory about the about the manuals because I find it amazing that when you start reading a manual from a computer from this uh, period, uh, you realize that they have to teach you what you can do with a computer. And I find that fascinating because nowadays you, you buy a tablet and you know what you can do with it. So you don't read the manual anymore. But back then they had to teach you there what to no do. They, they there teach no you manual to, the, to the TV. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I just or wanted to say, to your, you know, give it to your grandson and you'll find out. <laughs> I love your this shirt, is, Charles. This Carol. is one of the four. Yeah, one of the four shirts. I, I missed last meeting because my uh, my mother-in-law went into the hospital. But um, this is one of the four. So, I, you know, I, I 
wanted to show that off. And the other thing <laughs> is, you know, I was showing this earlier. This is the this is the brother. This is the EP twenty. Twenty. Right, which is and it smells great. I don't know why. <laughs> um, but anyway, <laughs> this is the one that has the you know, it's it's pretty similar if I yeah. do say so myself to the keyboard that's on the Timex. Right. This is probably okay. where they got it from, right? This is the actual brother unit here. That's awesome. So, that's awesome. Again, you, that I'll have, I'll, no. I'll have to buy one for the museum. <laughs> yeah, it, it 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 really looks like it. I mean, there's obviously the up down enter key, but it's just turn the turn ninety degrees, right? Or but uh yeah, it, it really looks like, you know, it's got the outlines around the keys. Um so they probably, yeah, might yeah. have lifted it from this from this okay. particular one one thing I find I found amazing from Dan Dan presentation was his uh, take on the micro drives because <laughs> I was seeing the the Boston presentation this afternoon and they were saying oh the, it looked like Clive Sinclair talking about micro drives it's going to be the best thing in the world and now oops <laughs> we made a mistake with it <laughs> yeah, I, I yeah it, it would have been nice to go further into that because I think those things were just uh, props more or less I mean they were probably real but obviously they were silver colored to, to match the 2068 design yeah, yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, that's kind of where I'm going with, I have to sand down the Sinclair because it's raised, right? And the mic, so you have to take that off and make it flat. Uh, but anyway, that's that's neither here nor there. But, I have to, uh, I have to be careful. Carl doesn't come over to my house and start sanding down my stuff. I'll be like, <laughs> get away from my hardware. What are you doing? And, and you know, cause uh, I saw that uh, silver TS-1000 you guys have over in the, uh, you know, your, your museum. And I was like, hmm. I might have to oh to get the paint cans. No, but those out. are yeah, those are <laughs> those are let's say uh, props like you said right. from the what they call the tool room where the the guy from the designing uh, over here Eric Suzano uh, made a lot of experience. The same happened with uh, I, I showed in the session about Argentina uh, some props we have here with different colors and things that never went to the market. So the, those were exper experiments. Same way. I have some um, uh, rubber key um, keyboards uh, uh, from the from the Far East, uh, from other companies that never went into the product. So from oh, wow. when they were choosing some samples, yeah, they wow. gave me a couple of those things. Well, it's been another okay. Fantastic. It's been Stuart's, an amazing. Stuart's meeting. on mute. Amazing. He's oh, trying to say let something. Let me let me uh, hit the <laughs> all unmute. Go ahead, Stuart. Uh, oh. I just wanted to chime in for those who may not know, uh, relevant to the basic manual being very good and, and people learning how to program with that computer. When the Raspberry Pi came out, the inspiration for that was the university, supposedly was the university professor seeing that there had been an arc in incoming students for like computer topics at the university level they saw this huge drop off in the preparedness of students when the computers changed from being open with like basic interpreters and different things you could program the computer. When they all switched into games where uh, you couldn't really program the games, you needed a, a development kit that cost 10,000 bucks or something or, or, or I know, getting too complicated. The, the, the geeky kids who were 15 year olds were playing games, but they were not programming. And the Raspberry Pi was partly introduced in response to that to come out with something that costs about as much as a textbook would, um, but was open and would get the, get, get youngsters back into play, uh, actually coding rather than just playing games. Playing games, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Even okay. the new version, the the four hundred, the Raspberry Pi four hundred, the, there was a lot of articles in UK saying that it's it's a, a renewed ZX Spectrum in the concept. Mm -hmm. Well, it literally is with and, keyboard. Yeah, Ryan, yeah, Ryan uses that's his all he emulation. uses. Is, he's over here yesterday with his four hundred, and he's like for like six hours we were just messing around, and like half of that time was on that four hundred, and he's just showing me everything he's been doing related to the twenty sixty eight and his programming on there. So, yeah, yeah. it's pretty crazy. Very that's awesome. Good. Yeah, that's awesome. also got uh, this one for Joel. Hey, hey Viarco, yeah, that's Portuguese, <laughs> Portuguese company from the eighties. I don't know. I don't think they exist anymore. Viarco. Nice. I do. 
<laughs> okay. Well, um, we'll see you March 6th. Is that right? I think that's right. Adam? Yeah. Hey, I don't know. You're in charge. I'm looking. Okay. March 6th. <laughs> yes. Today's the 19th, March 6th. Um, and I, actually, I want to say, Adam, you mentioned yeah. that someone had difficulty getting in. And I saw that. Alan oh, yeah. Brian out. did. Yeah. And Alan was oh. in, but somehow got bounced. Uh, yeah, he made, you, he's been chatting on the YouTube uh, chat. He's been putting messages. Re there. Reach out to me so we can sort this out and I can figure out how to so make me it. So me on a personal level? No, no, anybody. Anybody who has, oh. has a hard time getting in, reach out to me, um, you know, either through, through the groups.io or directly through the website. Okay. And we'll figure out why people can't get in and make it so that anybody who needs to get in, wants to get in, get can get in. Great. Um, yeah. And then, Thank you for uh, arranging this. Oh, it's yeah, I love this. <laughs> I hope you guys enjoyed it as much as I did. <laughs> yeah, especially to get Dan, because that was really impressive. Like I that said, that was a know. big one. That's the big Kahuna. Because <laughs> he's 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 got so much information in there, you know that it, like I said, just two hours or even an hour and a half that he was with us. Not enough. Not yeah. not going to cover it. I'm so. I'm hoping we can get him back. Yeah, we'll, 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 we'll bribe great. him with something. <laughs> Maybe we'll send him a t-shirt. <laughs> <laughs> oh, all right, Very guys. Well. Have a good have a good rest of your, your Sunday. Joao, thank you for sticking around. That's yeah. been awesome. We'll we'll chat about the next steps. Okay. Yes. All right. Awesome. Awesome. Wonderful. See you guys. Thank you.